フルカウンター Alright, so the seven Kadacha Bees have been a big part of Grand Cross since almost the beginning of the game. And finally, nearly after four years, we finally got a new story mode that's gonna add a lot of depth and character development towards the characters. However, there has been a bit of information out there. So today, we're gonna break down who the Kadacha Bees even are, their backstories, and then also as well break the newest chapter and also talk about what could come afterwards, because. I think I did a lot of research for the video. There's quite a lot of hints to what's to come, so let's just jump into it because it's probably going to be a long video. It did come out last week, and I do realize that people on JP probably aren't even going to read it because obviously it's in Japanese. But also, if you are on global, you probably don't care. And honestly, I don't blame you. What I'm doing right now, Netmarble should have done already on the YouTube channel or post just to give some background towards the characters. Because, like I said, there has been some lore towards the characters already, but you won't realize unless you read the passives and read the other events that already happened. So, Netmarble. I definitely should have done something here. Also, quick disclaimer, I haven't actually read the actual Valenti passive, the red one, and I haven't read the new Roxy passive either, so there may be some lore that I'm missing. Also, I'm assuming as well there have been past events that have given lore towards the characters, and I can't go back and look at them, so I'm not too sure. Uh, this is also my interpretation of the story that I've read. I may be wrong, but then again, uh, you know, who else is going to read it? <laughs> so, yeah, you take it as is. Alright, so before we get to the breakdown of the newest chapter, let's go over what we know about the characters already. To start off with Lilia, Lilia was a student on the Merle who was frustrated by her teachings. Because of this, she ended up leaving and promising that one day she was a past Merlin. When she left, she took refuge in a nearby forest where she would practice her summoning magic on innocent travelers by literally turning their souls from humans to monsters. Sometime later, to what I can only assume, she mastered her summoning magic to where she used it on herself, and that's why she's able to transform from Lilia to Lily of Desire. However, she cannot maintain this form which is why later on in chapter one we did not see her in this form that is because she could only stay in this form for a certain time also, this does explain why Lilia or all the catastrophes look so different in her awakened form. That's because she's literally transforming. One thing to know is that she always gets headaches. Once again, probably looking towards something coming in the future. Not too sure what it can be. But also, as well, this may not be relevant or maybe even canon. But Valenti had made her an outfit, which is the actual outfit she does get when she gets her actual Christmas outfit on. That does make it so she can stay in her form for longer. I don't know if it's actually canon or going to be relevant to the story, but I thought I'd ring up. Valenti, or formerly known as 32, which we find out later on during the chapter 1. Not much is known about her backstory until the actual newest chapter came out, but what we can tell from the backstory from one of the missions with Lilia, she got very angry when she found out people working at some site. They were working there against their will and forced to be there, like slaves basically, and she got very angry. Once again, kind of leaned towards that's kind of what she went through, and we do see a bit of that during chapter 1. She used to work in a laboratory to be a weapons researcher, and the reason why she escaped that place was because of Lilia, and that's why those two became friends. Eastern, the first time we see her, she has fallen from the sky because she was sent from another world. Literally, during, I think, one of her passive icons, it does confirm that both her and Mono are actually from different worlds. According to the wiki, it does say that Lilia and Valenti's combined efforts are the reason why Eastern got summoned to this world, and later on is the reason why Eastern did join the team to get revenge for the people that actually did cause the harm of her family. But Eastern was the next lord of the Ambilis family, but clearly something's gone wrong for her to be in Barnes' arms. One year later, after spending time with the actual Kadashavi characters, she does recall the fall of her family, indicating that something did go wrong, and this will definitely be explored later on during later chapters. Later on, while fighting, she does awaken. Literally, a scepter comes from her grimoire. Literally, probably referencing Black Clover, being honest with you lot. But the scepter that came from her grimoire, she recalls it that it could possibly be a family heirloom that symbolizes the authority of the ruler of the water. However, she hasn't seen it before, so you can't say for certain that it is. A little fear of mine, which could be true, could be wrong here, just my interpretation. But one of the three nightmares does actually look somewhat similar towards Eastern. So maybe the fall of her family and also the true scepter the one that is obviously the ruler of the seas could possibly be owned by this character rather than eastern and there'll be some back and forth between them two once again that's a little bit of theory but that's kind of what we have to go on her mono honestly there's not much to the character and i kind of probably even adds to the character because she kind of is an assassin obviously a bit uh, uh mysterious i guess you could say According to the wiki again, but it does say that Lilia was actually kidnapped by Merlin and in order to get her back, Valentia and also Eastern had to summon someone new to actually help them, you know, get her back. And the person they summoned was Mono, a person literally made for the sole purpose of killing and following orders. She later on does agree to join the team so she can find her own purpose in life as her own person. 
But in the blue awakened models passive, we do actually see a reason why she got her outfit. And this could be a way for Netmobile just to put her in an outfit just as a character. But their reasoning was because she looked into a magic mirror and she got the outfit that she wishes for. So this could allude that originally from her other world, she was in some one type country and she was either, you know, want to be a shogun or, you know, want to be the Raiden, if that's the right term to use for, I don't know. Once again, this just could be made up and just a reason for Netmarble just to copy Genshin. But Valenti does ask her that she can change her outfit, make a new outfit for her. But Mono refuses and decides to keep it and walks off crying. Once again, maybe reminiscing from her past because there's something close to her. Roxy, to my knowledge, literally has nothing. Like, literally nothing. Which is kind of explains why she was probably the first character out of the catastrophes to get so much lore during chapter 1. That's because nothing was there for her to begin with. Shin was literally Isekai to Britannia, he was sent from another world. So was Camilla, which is why Camilla and Shin get along so well. We do already know that Mono and Easton are from different worlds too, but they do point out that Shin and also Camilla do get along together just because of that. But at one point, we do get a little glance at his actual past, where we do see that he does have a younger sibling, whether that be a younger brother or younger sister, because they do refer to him as Big Brother, and they are trick-or-treating, but obviously, this is a nightmare, so clearly something went wrong here. This was a long time ago, so maybe they might wreck on it, but I guess the big thing to know about Shin is that he does have a younger brother or sister. His association does confirm that he once was a leader of a group, uh, we do get a little bit of tease, I believe, to something like that later on. So my interpretation is that he was a leader, but something failed and something ended up happening to that group and maybe his brother or sister too. Also, no side note, but Shin at one point does ask Valenti to make him new weapons and that will most likely be his awakened form. I think they did this a while ago and we're still yet to get it, but when we do get awakened Shin, it would be because of Valenti. And then finally, Camilla, who despite her having the least characters in the game out of the Cafes, has more lore than someone like Roxy. But Camilla Camilla is a DT from another world, and during the passive, she does find out that in Britannia, you know, the new world that she's in right now, that people are actually very friendly and kind towards werewolves and werebees. Once again, kind of going back to, I guess, Savago and Barn. Since she herself is some sort of beast herself, she does actually wonder if people from her original world, did they actually care for these sort of werewolves or beasts, indicating that the reason why she left her world was probably because she got bullied out of it. Yeah, she probably left her world because of racism. Crazy. According to the wiki though, it does say that Camilla was the guardian deity of the Beastmen and worshipped by them in her original world. However, she fell slowly into oblivion after the continuous demise of the Beastmen race. It does say that Lilia reached out to Camilla in another world through obviously, I guess, her voice in her head. And they do actually transfer her over to Britannia. But since Camilla's magic was too powerful, she ended up getting teleported to a random forest in Britannia. And that's where she learned about the werebees in Britannia and the fact they are treated as equals. But yeah, that is everything we know about the seven catastrophes up until this point. And once again, they kind of go a little bit into the backstories. And we do see later on, there are some more information that goes more in detail about every single backstory. Or at least a little tease of what's to come. So let's just go into breaking down the first chapter. All right, so chapter one starts like Ragnarok, where we get a little flash forward of what's to come. In fact, what we see right now is actually probably what's going to happen in chapter two. We just don't really get to that point by the end of chapter one. Not really. Because we do see the first look at the three nightmares obviously the main one in the middle already be confirmed and teased at the end of chapter one but the other two we actually don't know yet once again they both do look like eastern and i kind of went over that theory at the start of the video that one of them could in fact be somewhat related to eastern or also just be someone that eastern knows and was the reason why her family fell Despite Easton being from a different world, this time junction space is able to enter different dimensions, which will explain why she's here too. Also, a little side note, of course they're all girls, because once again, these are OC characters, and most people aren't going to care about the lore, so the best thing Netmobile can do is to make them hot, and all females. So uh, yeah, we're not going to probably see any male characters come from this uh, OC event. <laughs> But it is revealed that these three are the ones behind the actual clown mess that happened in Qatar. This was the first basically tease of the OC storyline coming to Grand Cross. Don't worry, it's nothing really important from this backstory. They are just the reason behind it. One of the mastermind walks forward and she snaps and boom, we get back to present day. The few hours before the event does happen. 
Currently, right now, all the Shafis are together in the time space junction. This is where Lilia is able to go to because of Merlin. She found out about this place from Merlin. But what are you trying to do? So, currently, right now, Lilia is trying to replicate the portal they saw on Qatar, explained by Roxy and the other Tashavis because they did see one during the clan mission. And what they are trying to do now is get to that portal to get to that new place they saw. Back in Qatar, they actually saw a portal and some of the Kashavi characters went through it and saw a place that does get revealed later on. Lilia, curious by what they said, they did explain that there was a different time space junction to what they're used to. So Lilia is now trying to replicate the portal to get back to that spot they saw. But Mono does describe what she saw in this portal, and she does say that there were piles of corpses stacked onto each other. It was basically a massive village that has been slaughtered. And I had seen they had been there for a very long time. After trial and error, the actual portal finally links back to what they actually saw the first time in Qatar. However, everything has been changed. Everything has been cleaned up. There are no bodies. They actually almost mistake this place as something different. However, Mono was able to smell the scent of blood. And there are still some actual scratch marks from Roxy's actual, you know, fighting. So this is the right place. However, things have been cleaned up. Almost as if someone's waiting for them to come to this place. Lilia comes to the conclusion that the time space junction they knew, the part they were used to, is actually a speck of dust in the grand scheme of things. The time space junction is a massive, massive, ever expanding place that can go on forever that holds a bunch of different dimensions together. And she explains the reason why she knew about this place was because of Merlin. The time space junction is the intersection of all dimensions and Lilia reveals that someone has now taken control of it. They come to the conclusion that if one of the dimensions clamps, it may expand onto another and at one point that could actually hurt their world. So since their world is now at risk, they have come together to try and stop the person now in control of the time space junction. While exploring the misty area, they start to hear a voice and they do quickly recognize the voice that it is Melvin. Don't worry, Melvin is basically just a new character. He apparently was in the last last mission with the OZ characters but he was just someone who told them where to go. Roxy being the character she is she basically scares him and gets him to explain what's going on why is he here and he quickly reveals that the mastermind plans to absorb all the life forces from all the dimensions to become an all-powerful being. Lilia asks Melvin to show her where the mastermind currently is and since they are in a massive mist they start to walk forward and get closer towards where the mastermind actually is. However they quickly realize there is a massive orb that is actually siphoning all of the any towards it indicating that this is the place where the mastermind set everything in motion. Roxy starts to run towards the massive orb and then Lilia quickly realizes the marking on the floor she tries to stop them in time but unfortunately it's too late as Melvin smirks and then all of the catastrophes get trapped into a massive of orb and he does say that they now have to experience their tragic past they wish never happened so at this point we get the backstory of valenti and roxy but going forth now we are probably going to get mostly the backstory of all the characters i imagine we're going to get maybe two to three catastrophes actual backstories each chapter which does mean at one point boys we are going to get a new shin and also new camilla because we have to get that backstory so camilla is actually going to get a new character crazy but chapter one does focus on Roxy and Osa Valenti. Starting with Valenti, we do get the reveal that her original name was called 32, and she was a weapon researcher forced to make things against her will. Her supervisors wants her to make a magic weapon, but due to the harm that it can cause, she decides not to, and instead makes the first appearance of the Mark II or Valenti bots that we have seen bosses in Grand Cross. Venti and her MK2 bots do actually fight the supervisors and she does actually win. However, the alarm quickly runs off and she tries to escape, running through a bunch of obstacles that is basically stopping her from escaping. But as she reaches the end, the door magically closes and she wasn't able to escape and then she did actually end up getting caught again. However, as she is getting dragged back, time does rewind, most likely her being forced to relive the past over and over again until it somehow stops. We now move on to Roxy and her backstory, and we do see a small child that Roxy does refer to as Big Sister. Now, I could be misinterpreting this, but I imagine Roxy at this point is actually still a child. However, she is reliving her past as an adult. So what we see right now, she is currently a child, which explains why she's calling the younger girl Big Sister, because she is actually younger, I guess. But uh, maybe it's not the case. Maybe she's calling her Big Sister. They also refer to her as Roxy's friend. Uh, I'm it's her sister. I think the translation just got confused here, but this is in fact Roxy's sister. 
Did you confirm that Roxy was forced into a life of a gladiator? She was basically a slave forced to fight. So because of this, she went through a lot of trauma and it explains why she's always wanted to fight and why she's got a bad temper and always runs into things because that's what her past was. They explain Roxy was the muscle of the group and the sister was the brains. She was the one who came up with all the plans and in doing so, they managed to escape the place. But while trying to escape, they do actually get caught and are forced to fight. During this point, Roxy keeps on getting some sort of memories of her sister talking. Once again, since she is now reliving the past, she actually starts to remember what actually is about to happen later on. Both girls run away and honestly, we actually get some pretty good shots here and good fight scenes. The slave master comes up and catches up with them and then goes for a massive attack onto Roxy. However, the sister, big sister, I guess we're calling her, does jump in front of her, basically sacrificing herself and Roxy's sister says so she falls off a massive cliff and with the fact that she just lost her big sister, Roxy absolutely snaps and goes mental. The actual animations and fight scenes is actually really good here and it's kind of a shame that we're not getting any voice acting because there's actually a pretty cool scene to hear the actual, like, I guess, the trauma in her voice if they actually had the, you know, voice actors for it. Roxy ends up defeating the Slave Master with his swords, and this is how she gets her iconic chainsaw swords that we do see in the new character. However, suddenly her sister does appear behind her, and at this point, Roxy now starts remembering what happens next. We see what happened play out through her memory, where it does reveal that Roxy's sister does actually shoot her, not killing her, but does shoot her, kills the Slave Master, and actually decides to become the next Slave Master. So she's the one who takes over the gladiators and becomes the next King King, basically. Roxy was able to remember this in time, so she attacks her sister to obviously stop what was about to happen and to change the past, basically. However, since it is just an illusion and this actually isn't meant to happen, there is a massive barrier in front of it. Confused by this, she starts whacking at it, and that's basically all she can do. She does break the illusion and actually escapes the trap, going back towards the time junction. Now that she's back in the time junction, she looks behind and sees that her friends are still in this actual trap. She's still getting voices from the actual sister. Once again, maybe reacting acting some post trauma that she's now reliving or maybe she's always been hearing this it's just it's the first time we are now seeing it confused by what's going on she asks melvin what's actually happening however she does actually not care and decides to check up on her friends first at this point we can actually go towards the characters and get a little bit of dialogue towards what's actually going on here so we get a little bit of a tease of what they're experiencing and this is all what they say Mono says a weapon designed to kill is so her backstory is going to be about probably her as a child even being trained to kill and trained to be assassin. Honestly, pretty standard to what you expect towards Mono. Moving over to Eastern, she does say I killed them. Now this is obviously hinted towards her family. We do know her family basically all died here and she may have been the reason behind it. I don't think she's the one that actually killed them, but most likely blaming herself for whatever happened during the actual fall of the Ambilis family. Honestly, Eastern probably has the most law and concrete evidence about what's going to happen between her backstory. So, so honestly, I'm looking forward to whatever they do with her because uh, she looks like the most interesting one so far. Camilla says, I couldn't protect them. Now, we do know that she did leave her actual other world or, you know, was forced to leave it. And we do know that people in their world didn't treat her kind you know, the werewolves. And we do say in her association that she did lose everything. So either her family, her loved ones, her children, who knows what it could be. But clearly, whatever happened in the other world, since they didn't like werebeasts, they most likely killed her friends, family, or, you know, children. And she was forced to leave, so she couldn't protect them. So that's most likely what Kimmel's backstory is going to be about. Shin is even more cryptic. He simply just says, I can't fail. Once again, we do know he was a leader of another group. So maybe once again, during a mission, during a dungeon raid, which is literally what his name is in game, he failed his group and his group ended up dying. His family may have died. He was a younger brother or sister. And that's most likely what his past is going to be about. Lilia, we do know she's kind of obsessed with Merlin, trying to surpass her, trying to get her recognition. And her backstory is going to be about Merlin. All she does say is Merlin to you, I'm... Once again, we kind of already know Lilia does think that Merlin thinks that she is someone who's not worthy. So I'm kind of curious how this is going to work out because we're going to get more backstory between Lilia and Merlin, which is uh, kind of cool. I do like Merlin's character, so we'll take it. And then we want Valenti. Valenti just says, I'm almost there. We just saw her backstory, so we do know that it's referring to her escaping or trying to escape, but then getting caught. So that is all we know of the backstory so far. Once again, I kind of like they did this, and you may have actually missed it even if you did read the actual story because you have to go towards the characters here. And um, I thought this was a nice little touch. 
After Roxy checks on her friend, she then goes towards Melvin, who obviously is the only one to blame here. And of course, Roxy, the only thing she knows how to do is punch someone. So she goes to give her a massive punch. But right before, obviously, the punch does land, the mastermind appears with a new tentacle, very reminiscent of, obviously, Melascula and 70 Sin. So she fits quite well in the universe. But obviously, the main color aesthetic of the character is green. And we did see already that the other two are obviously red and blue. So whatever your favorite color may be, you're going to love one of three of these characters here. But she does reveal her name that is Sun. Knock, and she does say I'm the caretaker of my adorable Lloyd children. Don't know if she's referring to the two other nightmares, but I imagine she's referring to the catastrophes because so far already she's the one who's been leading all these characters to where they are right now. To be fair, she may be the ones involved with their actual backstory, why they even came to this universe and what's been going on. So she does see the catastrophes as their children. So that's uh, kind of how it ends. We do see the last look at a nice little screenshot there. And of course, it does end off with obviously Roxy be able to roam around, but she shouldn't be able to do that because she probably likely got caught because of the abyss effect underneath her but you can obviously explore and uh, get a close look at the in-game model of obviously Subnuck who is uh, a character will be definitely summoned. You can go towards the catastrophes again to get even more dialogue however this time there isn't that much information uh, honestly the only one that's noticeable is Shin which said his strategy failed. Once again we know who's a leader we know that he couldn't protect them we know that his strategy now has failed so it's very likely when we do get his backstory Story, he is going to be probably a dungeon raider and his whole party died basically that's what i imagine so boys that is going to wrap up the first chapter this video is definitely a lot longer mainly because we're going over the background and the whole lore of the actual catastrophe so going forth when we start breaking down chapter two if i do actually decide to cover it because i imagine not a lot of people may care about this storyline but i'll see how the video does turn out so boys thank you for watching let me know what you think of the story chapter and what you think of the catastrophes i will say i didn't really care about them but i've now grown to appreciate them a little more in grand cross However, I still prefer Seven Sins, and I don't think we need that much OCs in the game, but uh, at least they look good, right? As long as the characters have good design, I'm all for it, but typically in the past few OC characters, they've all been kind of mediocre and um, not really you know, competitive or meta, I guess you'd say. So we'll have to wait and see how the meta turns out after we do get new OCs, because there are a bunch to come now that we know we're going to be getting probably awakened versions of Shin Camilla, uh, new OC characters, freedom at least. There might be some behind the scenes again. There's going to be so much more OCs coming to the game, so we'll have to wait and see how that works out. So boys, thank you for watching. Let me know if I got anything wrong or if you interpreted the story a little bit different than what I did. So boys, thank you for watching, and uh, yeah, peace.